Welcome to Unit 2, The Media of Art, Lesson 11, Design Disciplines. This lesson focuses on the prevalence of graphic design and other related design disciplines in our daily lives. Design as an important means of communication that can attract, inform, and persuade is established. Different types of graphic and product design, the functions of design, as well as the tools and technology involved are all discussed. The objectives for this lesson are to demonstrate the prevalence of design in our everyday lives, analyze graphic design's function in communicating different ideas, describe the emerging disciplines of motion graphics and interactive design, assess everyday products that integrate utility, technology, and cutting-edge design, and define terminology used in graphic and product design. The topics we'll be covering are graphic design, typography, logos, posters, and other graphics motion graphics, interactive design, and product design. There are many design disciplines. We'll be primarily focusing on graphic design with a little bit of industrial design and interactive design thrown in there. But some of the other disciplines are textile design, clothing design, interior design, environmental design, and even though we're going to be handling this as something unique unto itself, architecture also fits in within the design disciplines. The term graphic design is pretty broad, but it can be broken down in a few different ways. As the process of working with words and pictures to enhance visual communication, and a creative process employing art and technology to communicate ideas. Saks Fifth Avenue opened its first department store back in the mid-1920s, so it's been around for quite a long time. They, just as NASA, felt it was necessary back in 2007 to rebrand themselves and redefine their logo. They used designer Michael Beirut, who took the original logo and subdivided it into 64 different squares. You can actually see the newer version of the logo printed on the outside of the bags and on the inside uh, portion where the bag folds uh, you can see the original Saks Fifth Avenue. What's interesting is that logo is so recognizable that even jumbled up into different squares you can still identify who the logo is for. Topography is an integral part of graphic design. It is the art and technique of composing printed material from letter forms, which are known as typefaces or fonts. One of the main goals of a typographer is to create a successful typeface or font that will achieve the certain goal that the designer has uh, had in mind with the function of their typeface. For example, when we look at this slide, the descriptive elements when you look at the words for serifs and sans serif. Those are supposed to be easily legible so we can navigate through them quickly and consume the information. Other typefaces are more decorative and can take on some type of a descriptive element to the word that it's uh, spelling out. When I mentioned uh, serifs, serifs is a part of uh, the Roman typeface genre which has of course been around for quite a long time. Serifs are short lines with pointed ends at an angle to the main strokes as you see in the word mother at the top. The words sans serif mean without serifs. These are these other three typefaces that we see the uh, Nobel Armada and Garage Gothic. Even though they have distinctly different personalities to them they are all sans serif in this slide, we have the development of and the final results of the design of the Clearview Highway typeface by Donald Meeker, which has been used since 2004 to present. This is essentially a redesign of a vintage or retro font that has been used in many variations since the 1950s. Meeker worked with the Federal Highway Administration to develop this font. If you look at the top image, there's a comparison between the older and the new letters and the uh, transition uh, between all of them. This did go through rigorous testing just to make sure that this would be visible in all sorts of weather and lighting conditions. This work is titled The American Alphabet. It's by artist Heidi Cody from the year 2000. 
what Heidi Cody did is she took very recognizable American products and took the letters off of them and formed them into an alphabet. What I'd like to do right now is give you all about 10 seconds to look at this alphabet real quick and see if you can identify any of the uh, products that are associated with the letters. I'll come back in about 10 seconds. Well, hopefully you were able to identify many of them. I'll scroll through the um, products associated with each of the letters. A is for all laundry soap. B is for Bubblicious gum. C is for Campbell's, namely Campbell's soup. D is for Dawn dish soap. E is for Ego. F is for Fritos. G is for Gatorade. H is for Hebrew National Hot Dogs. I is for Ice. J is for Jello Sugar Free. K is for Kool-Aid, L is for Lysol, M is for M&M's Peanut, N is for Nilla Wafers, O is for Oreos, P I'm sure is probably one of the most recognizable in here, that is of course for Pez, Q is for Q-Tip, R is for Reese's, S is for Starburst, T is for Tide Laundry Soap, U is for Uncle Ben's, for Uncle Ben's Rice, V is for V8, W is for whisk laundry soap, X is for extra laundry soap, Y is for York peppermint patties, and Z is for zest soap. This is You Blow Me Away from 2007 by Craig Ward. Ward is an artist working in the graphic design realm, did this as a personal project. He believes that words function just like pictures. And rather than this being developed for a company as an advertisement or something, this is an advertisement, so to say, for his opinion. This is screen printed glass and photography, and besides being exhibited in some type of digital format, as you see here, would probably most likely be seen in a gallery. The font that Ward used in this image is Helvetica, which is perhaps one of the most popular fonts around and has a long strong history associated with graphic design. This next section is on logos and symbols. A logo is defined as an identifying mark or trademark based primarily on letter forms and a symbol is an identifying mark based on pictorial rather than typographic sources. Logos can be for individuals, companies, or corporations a logo is an important part of branding that is a stamp of identity for an individual or a company. This image here is of the logo of NASA from the NASA letterhead from 1959. The designer was James Motorelli. The logo uses an arrow, planets, and stars to symbolize spaceflight. Institutions that stay around as long as NASA has sometimes have to go through a process of rebranding to identify themselves with a newer generation. This is the logo from 1974 of NASA's letterhead from designers Dan and Blackburn of New York. Quality graphic design can be simple and straight to the point such as in this logo. If you look at the A's they are symbolized more as the tips of rockets. Rockets, of course, back in the early 70s were the main source of uh, space travel until the space shuttle came around in the late 70s. NASA again redesigned their logo back in 1992, almost another 20 years after the previous design. Here's an example from the NASA letterhead by logo designer James Motorelli. This is a simplified and more straighter to the point version of the original logo. It's, as a matter of fact, it is by the original logo designer. It's also returned back to the more optimistic view of space travel that was around in the 50s and 60s. In the previous slides, I used the NASA logos to describe and go over what logos are, the reasons for possibly changing them with companies with long histories. I thought that was a much better way to go over logos. It was a portion from the previous version of the text 
Text for the, some reason this time around decided to use these two logos to go over the section about logos, and I had a little bit of an issue with that in the sense that this is a little bit beyond the standard definition of a logo in the sense that your text goes over that an artist group, Superflex, acquired these particular logos after the closing of these banks, more as artistic images to show how images can communicate information. I thought the NASA logos were a little bit better as explaining exactly why artists do that, designers, and why they are important to companies. I do believe that there's an important aspect to show that some images do communicate ideas without necessarily being associated with words or anything going with it, but it's a little important, I think, to go over the context of logo development and design as with the NASA logos. We are now moving on to posters, advertisements, and graphics. A poster is a concise visual announcement that provides information through the integrated design of typographic and pictorial imagery. Here are a few posters by graphic designer Taz Mavion Davies. You may recognize his name from the beginning of the course when we were going over the purposes and functions of art, talking about art for social causes. Chaz Mavion Davies designed the Global Warning poster. The posters in this slide are also dealing with social causes. On the lower left we have Article 15, Everyone Has the Right to Nationality and Change It. This was based off of the uh, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 15 is a part of that, so he used it in the poster design. The poster on the lower right was to protest the Robert Mugabe regime back in 2000. Mugabe was known for brutal tactics in his rule. Uh, absolute Power is also based off of the designs for Absolute Vodka advertisements. This is a photograph of a silkscreen poster in its natural presentation environment. Everything we've been looking at is actually the design. These posters were made in Amsterdam to draw a little bit of attention to the tourist trade, mainly focusing on historical sites and the problems that come with that. A lot of times when places are designated as historical areas, they have restrictions on modernization. So we have a little bit of social commentary here made through a poster. And it's nice to see it there presented actually, in a sense, as a monument for the viewer to look at. This magazine cover, New Yorkistan, from the December 10th, 2001 edition of the New Yorker magazine. Also has some social commentary in it, but it uses a extreme heavy dose of humor. This is a drawing of the boroughs of New York, but they have various different names like Wretched Kurtz and Botoxia, Phasmina, and Alzheimer's. Very funny humorous names, but poking fun at uh, the city of New York. This logo was designed as a wallpaper for an iPhone. It's by Jonathan Barnbrook, titled Olympuke, Drowning in Advertising, from 2009. This is just a commentary about the overwhelming amount of advertising and commercials that were going on for the 2010 Olympic Winter Games. He appropriated a portion of the Coca-Cola logo, and if you see the little sphere and the stick shape in there, it symbolizes a person drowning. This slide is of Jamie Reed's cover for the single God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols in 1977. This is a prime example of bad press can also be good press. The song itself was banned from the radio in Great Britain back in 1977. It still became the number one hit. A few years ago, this was listed number one in the top 100 record covers of all time. The next category is motion graphics. Motion graphics are usually involved with film, television, computers, and the web. This is a film still from the opening title sequence. 
for the Alfred Hitchcock film Psycho from 1960 by Saul Bass. The title sequence is meant to symbolize the subject of the movie. The movie was one of the first slasher films, so uh, there's a lot of knife-wielding and slashing in the movie itself. It has one of the most famous murder scenes uh, from Celluloid, which is the shower scene in which Janet Leigh gets murdered. But the music and the way the letters are cut apart and transition from one name to the other uh, symbolize the knife cutting from the film. The letters are slashed, sliced and diced up, and new names pop up, and then they transition the same way. What Saul Bass had done with the opening title sequence for Psycho was a tradition that did stick around in, in filmmaking for a long time. It had started to die out in the 1970s and 80s. In uh, 1995, when David Fincher released his film Seven, it had one of the most unique title sequences since the older days of uh, classic filmmaking. Kyle Cooper designed the sequence and in many ways it resembles the uh, Saul Bass sequence from Psycho but in a completely different fashion. Both of them are movies about uh, murder and serial killers but uh, achieved in a completely different way. There's a really gritty sensibility about Seven's title sequence. There's a lot of scratching um, and distress surfaces. The Sometimes the titles that you're reading are skipping so quickly back and forth that it's hard to read them. It was more about the art of it than actual completely reading the, uh, the titles. But anyways, it's partly symbolic of the gritty nature of the movie itself, and behind it you actually see the preparation of the killer for some of his dirty deeds that he's doing throughout the film. In this slide we have some examples of Karen Fong's design work and a portrait of her. In the upper left hand corner we have an example of some of the frames from the opening title sequence for the television series Rubicon from 2010 which was short-lived but it is an example of her style which you can compare to what you see in the lower right hand corner which is the Lincoln Center info peel by Karen Fong and Mark Gardner. The info peel is actually a term specifically coined for this graphics operation, so to say, that we have shapes that basically get peeled away to reveal information, possibly concert dates and upcoming events. Our next category is interactive design. Interactive design is a pretty new aspect of the design disciplines that we'll be uh, discussing here for a few slides. One artist, musician, innovator that I have admired for many years is Bjork, who's originally from Iceland. She got her start in the late 80s uh, with a band called the Sugar Cubes. In the early 90s, she ventured off into a solo career and really started broadening the scope of electronic music and bringing different media to the table. When she released her album by Ophelia in 2011, it was also released as an application for the iPad, and I think there's also one for the iPhone uh, that works a little bit differently, but for the first time that I had ever seen in a musical presentation, you can interact with the music with a visual interface as you see here in this uh, image. So essentially you would be dragging your finger along a song once you click on it. It brings you to this kind of undulating animation that plays the song back. But as soon as you touch any part of this little screen that's going on, the song actually changes. So with each person touching it in a different formation, the song will change. So I would say possibly for the first time someone created a release of music that actually includes the listener and I guess now you can call it the viewer as well since you have to interact with it visually into the musical experience so you're almost participating with Bjork in performing her music. In this slide we have an interactive design facade on a building for the Torada Design Architects in Japan from 2009. Essentially on the face of this building 
as a giant QR code. For most people, this should be familiar, but in case you aren't, it's a quick response code, which you can find on most modern advertising, usually in posters and magazines, so you somehow get a chance to interact with further information offered by the company. What's very interesting about this, in a sense, is this is only for the curious, that you physically have to see what's on this billboard by interacting with the QR code. So you have to snap your photo of it and go to the information online and see what's provided. I would say since this is such a part of the design, so to say, of the building, I'm sure most people driving by would notice it. It's much different than most standard QR codes that you see very small in the corner of some advertisement. Here it just smacks you in the face and kind of compels you to be a little bit curious and investigate it further. Our last category in this lesson is product design. This product design example is the OLPC X03 computer designed by Fuse Project. OLPC stands for one laptop per child and this is an attempt at making computers accessible to every child on earth. Now this is meant to also be cheap and accessible at $100 per unit. At the same time this is supposed to defy any type of language limitation so anything that will be in here is going to be strongly associated with symbols and images which is a big part also of graphic design. So we have product design with a graphic design interface that's meant to be understood hopefully universally by all Motorcycle and automobile designers are also product designers. When we think about modern transportation, there are many eras where the design of the objects of transportation are merely just within its function. Probably starting in the mid-1950s, we get a personalization aspect to design, and we have many automobiles and motorcycles come out that have a lot of personality within their design. So some people may want to have a motorcycle to express some type of style or personality that they have, or it could be just simply to get you from point A to point B. One of the design features of this motorcycle is it actually show what it doesn't have, which is a gas engine. This is powered by electricity. So still meant to look cool, and as if it has some speed, which it quite certainly does at around 150 miles per hour, to compete with the other side of motorcycles, which is our traditional gas engines. I'd be interested to actually hear this motorcycle, because part of the style that sometimes people want out of motorcycles is the sound that it creates. Harley Davidson actually has a patent on the sound of their engines. Usually the sound gets processed through mufflers and other types of designs and actually makes a very, very specific sound. So I'd be curious to see what the Mission 1 sounds like. The product design in the slides we've looked at so far have been all of consumer grade products that we regular people tend to interact with. Now uh, what we have here is the design for the QR5 wind turbine designed by Quiet Revolution Limited from 2009. Larger objects still have to be designed and serve some type of function. Usually uh, large objects that serve a function like a wind turbine, which is to create energy, doesn't have a necessary uh, visual appeal to it, but if you speak to people in communities that have many wind turbines, they are thought of as being giant eyesores to the community. So Quiet Revolution Limited made an attempt at creating a functional wind turbine that also was a lot more pleasing to the eye. We are now at the end of Lesson 11 Design Disciplines. I just wanted to throw this in real quick. This was an aspect that was covered in previous editions of the text that we're using for this course, and that is to acknowledge Apple for its design ingenuity. Back in the old days, back in 1984, Apple Macintosh really changed product design for the good. 
It actually took still several years for the computer to kind of get into the home. Let's say the 90s is pretty much when everyone was starting to get complete access to the computer. Now, the computer was a part, of course, of office life, but Macintosh, of course, was focusing on home computing. They dropped out a little bit when Steve Jobs was no longer with the company, but they came back in full swing in the late 90s with innovative designs with their Macintosh computers. And, of course, in the mid-2000s with the uh, invention of the iPod and then eventually the iPhone and the iPad. And I'm sure there's still things lurking in the future for Apple. Thanks for listening.